All right, welcome to Bible study at First Baptist Church, Gainesville, Florida. I'm the esteemed Bible teacher, Pastor Eric Spivey. No, I'm just, I'm just Pastor Eric. It is great that we all are gathered here today. Um, we're going to be studying, um, beginning a new um, uh, study uh, on the, the life of King Solomon. And so we're going to be looking at the last um, portion of... Um, First Chronicles, and then the rest, and then kind of move into um, Second Chronicles. So, you know, the, we've got these six sort of key Bible um, books that sort of talk about the various kings and king um, and kingdoms of Israel. You have uh, First and Second King, uh, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and here First and Second Chronicles. All are sort of telling the story in different ways. Chronicle does Chronicles does a lot of um, List of helping to tell the tell the story of these of these um, um, kings through through listings. Um, first and Second Samuel really tells the story of, of of David and his life, and then a little bit more of a, kind of at the ending with Solomon. And so we're going to look at the uh, at the life of Solomon today. It's really about the beginning portion of that. How does Solomon become king? What does that transition look like? And so really today is about um, King David. And I want to, and, and we've got a few of you all here that you can maybe answer this for me as well, is have you ever had an experience where you, you've had to make a choice or maybe even sometimes when the choice was taken from you where you had to say either yes or no to some type of, of an experience, um, maybe like when you, um, you know, asked your um, wife to marry you. You know, you had you had made one choice, and she had the choice of saying yes and no. Um, uh, maybe it was um, about a job. You had to say yes or no to a job, or a job had to say yes or no to you. Um, this week, we were, I was telling the teaching this Bible story, um, this Bible study with our um, with Miss Joanne Parham's class and Miss Betty Park Oil, um, who's in her 90s, you know, still remembers um, being at Warm Springs the Sunday before um, uh, FDR passed away. Uh, she was telling the story about when her husband um, had a job with Eastern Airlines, and all of a sudden, Eastern Airlines no longer existed. And they had to make a new choice, and that choice was them to come up to Gainesville for him to go to school. And so they had two daughters, and now all of a sudden they had to move into um, student housing for him to go back to school, and she had to pick up a job. And then she talked about how well everything sort of turned out after that. You know, those are those, those moments in our lives when there is a, a – where something happens. You know, I think about um, especially – often related to jobs. You know, when, when th things are sort of out of our control, you, you apply for a job and you don't know whether you're going to get the job or not. You, you know, especially when it relates to um, preaching. You know, I, I, that's kind of my world, you know, is preachers having to choose to, um, to follow the calling of God. And I talk about the, um, the pastor selection process is a little bit like The Bachelor. You might watch that before, you know. You've got the, um, ba the, the bachelor or the bachelorette and they've got all of these um, uh, contestants who are vying to, to be their love interest and the bachelor when he chooses someone he gives them a rose and it's not you know the first you know few episodes aren't too bad because you're going from like 26 down to 20 and you know you don't really know someone but you know you, you're not really emotionally bought into it but ultimately you're getting down to you know where you, people are starting to have feelings and you start to imagine your life with these people and you either get a rose or you don't and if you don't get a rose you have to figure out what to do about that and um, you know when you're kind of going when you're a pastor and you're putting your name out there and um, for a particular church um, you know if you don't make the first cut yeah it's, it's fine you know if you don't make the second cut you're, you're a little bit more disappointed but by the time that you are the the top two or three people um, and you've gotten a chance to imagine yourself in this um, in this place or in this church and then all of a sudden if you get a no, it's not, it's, it's not just, you, you've, you're, you're having to, there's an emotional link to that. 
And you've had to say, okay, God's saying no to this. Something that I saw myself doing, I'm no longer able to do. Which was a little bit different in the way when, we, when I, with my call here at First Baptist Church, because um, by the time that I was um, interviewing with First Baptist, um, your search committee had been going for two years. Y'all remember this. And by the, I was the ninth person they brought in to interview with them. And you could tell when we were meeting with the search committee, I mean, they knew, they knew the system. They knew where we met. They knew, what, they knew what to have for breakfast. They knew what we were going to have for lunch. They knew all of that system. But they also knew that when they saw, and they saw something in me pretty quickly, that they said yes. And that was a kind of a big challenge for me then, because then we had to decide, are we feeling called to come to this church and it took us about a month of doing our own research of having to imagine our lives here of kind of um of, of just sort of saying is this where god is leading us and that we've never looked back this has been one of the greatest decisions of our calling in our lives that this is where god has brought us so you think about these these challenges when when we get yes the, of, of when things are get, kind of have yes and no in our lives and you think about king david who is kind of the key person the, key, the king that's so um, uh, that's the ideal king in all of Israel, both before um, kind of leading up to David and then after. And for the most part, in David's life, God shines on David. I mean, from the time that he's this young boy, he's rugged, he's handsome, you know, but he's out there, you know, he's got all these older brothers that look down upon him. But from the time that he's there, you know, Samuel pulls him out of, the, um, out of the fields and comes and anoints him with oil. And then as, he's, um, as he um, begins to find his way, every time he has a chance, it's almost like God smiles on him again. And then um, he finds his way as to being the king. And then as the king, God continues to smile. And pretty much everything that he tries um, succeeds. He's able to capture Jerusalem and makes that the, the capital city. He's able to um, unify all these 12 tribes. He's able to expand their kingdom. He, all of this money rolls in, the power and the prestige, all of it rolls in. Now, there's lots of stories about his, you know, about his sin, and, we, and, that, and that's another part of David's life. But one of the... The only times that David gets told no is at the end of his life. And that's kind of our passage today. Because David really wants to build a temple that will allow... Um, I'm echoing, aren't I? Maybe if it, is this any better? Still echoing? Better? How about I do this? Hold on. Can you hear me now? Still echoing, though. Hold on. If you're online, I'm about to get up and, lo and lo lower the um, volume. Hold on. All right. Is this better? Okay. Yes, I could tell. It was annoying me and y'all at the same time. So, uh, so we're talking about King David, and uh, David really wants to build this, this temple because what he wants, what he sees that the temple has this powerful effect on his people because not only will they have Jerusalem as their capital, but now they will build into the practices of the people where everybody has to come to one place to worship. And so this worship will give the people one place, one place to sort of look to, to God. And then when he comes to do it, God says no and it's in that no that David receives that was going to that we're going to come back to this challenge of thinking through of how um, Solomon his son takes on this new challenge so let's start today so we're looking at chapter um, 28 of first chronicles and we're going to just we're going to read through the um, uh, we're just going to read each, we're going to read the first 10 verses. We're going to read through those, and I'm going to talk through them a little bit, ask us a little question to kind of think through, and, um, and kind of go from there. So, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. So, David assembled at Jerusalem all of the officials of Israel, the officials of the tribes, 
the officers of the divisions that serve the king, the commanders of the thousands, the commanders of the hundreds, the stewards of all the property and cattle of the king and his sons, together with the palace officials, the mighty warriors, and all the warriors. And then King David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brothers and my people. I have planned to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, a temple for the footstool of our God. And I made provisions for building. So I want us to take for a second to think about the setting of this passage. So David is a very formal setting. David is, is calling all of the, um, the palace elite into one place. So notice who all they list. I mean, all of the palace officials of the king, all the different officials of all the tribes, um, all of the commanders of, the, of his standing army. But he also goes back and he invites um, who he calls the mighty warriors. These are the men who fought with him to help, defeat Saul, to help defeat Saul and to establish his kingdom. And so these are, the, like, these are folks who sort of live in the, in the mythology of the people. And he invites all of them there because he's about to do something. He's about to transfer power from himself to Solomon. And this, by bringing all these different people together, he wants to show a unified front. So a part of what's happening here is, is David is hearing this. David has heard this note, you are not to build the temple. And now he has to figure out, how can I help my son to build the temple? And what he's doing is he's bringing all these different people of the, of the kingdom to one place to show a unified front. We all are in this together. Then verses 3 and 4. So David has assembled all these things for the temple. Um, he, he wants to build this house. It's what he wants to do. But then he said, verse 3, But God said to me, You shall not build a house in my name, for you are a warrior and have shed blood. Yet the Lord your God of Israel chose me from all my ancestral house to be king over Israel forever. For he chose Judah as leader, and in the house of Judah, my father's house, and among my father's sons, he took delight in making me king over all of Israel. Why does God tell David no? He says, for you are a warrior and shed blood. There is still blood on your hands for what all has happened to you and how you have come about this king, in, this, in, this, in this kingly world. So David has a plan. He, want, he knows what he wants to do, but God tells him no. But God has another plan. You know, sometimes when we think that when we hear a no, all we hear is how it, how it impacts us. What often we're not able to do is to see how that no is a part of God's overall plan. So God tells David no, not because he doesn't want David to build, because he's got something better that he wants to take place. There's someone that, that by, by Solomon building it will create something new for the people. What if we think about our no's like that? That our no's are not just no's to us, even though we feel them, but they're part of God's plan. They're part of God, God what, it, what it might be best for us, even best for God's kingdom. And so here we see David beginning to establish this idea among the people that God, has, God is doing something bigger than even David. That David has, God has chosen Judah. Judah was the tribe that David came out of. There were 12 tribes of Israel. Judah was one of them. And it becomes sort of the, 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 the tribe of these, of, these, um, of these kings that will follow after David. And what he's wanting to do is trying to help his people, all of the tribes of Israel, to accept Solomon as their new, um, as their new king, as this one who's going to take, who's going to continue the legacy of David. And then verse seven and no verses five and six. And David says, and all my and for and of all my sons, the Lord has given me many. 
He has chosen my son Solomon to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. He has said to me, It is your son Solomon who shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be a son, and I will be father to him. Now David had already had this conversation with the Lord. This is the formal retelling of it in front of all of Israel. But in um, 1 Chronicles chapter 22, he gives... David hears this message from Nathan, and then he tells his son Solomon. So they've had this, these conversations in private, but now he, we're giving this, this news to the, to the people of Israel. And if you think about what challenges David has in making this transfer of power, um, David has a whole variety of sons, and they haven't all been... Um, uh, they haven't all very much supported David. Um, one of the stories that you'll hear, that you, one of the great stories is, the son, is his son Absalom, who stages a coup, creates a civil war, runs David out of Jerusalem, chases him down, and it's not till one of David's mighty men and one of his lieutenants who actually finds, Sol, um, finds Absalom and stuck, um, stuck in a tree um, before he comes and kills him to kind of take away that challenge to David's throne. And so... Bloodshed over the, the challenge of the kingship is not unusual. That's what happened between David and Saul. It's happened with some of other David's sons. And now David is trying to create a, a peaceful transfer of power, one in which Solomon will be able to complete David's legacy and that, that there will be continued peace in the kingdom. And then verse 7 and 8. I will establish his kingdom forever as he continues. To re um, this is God speaking. I will establish David's kingdom forever if he continues resolute in keeping my commandments and my ordinance as he is today. Now, therefore, in the sight of all of Israel, the assembly of the Lord and the hearing of our God, observe and search out all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess your, this good land and leave it for an inheritance to your children for after you forever. So they, God has made a covenant with David that's very unique. Um, covenants are these Old Testament binding contracts. They're, they're this relationship where people promise things to one another. We, the very first covenant we see is with God and um, Abraham, where God makes a covenant with Abraham that he will, that if Abraham um, uh, uh, blesses um, and the, those around him, God will stay, stay committed to him and he will bless Abraham and all of his descendants. And there is this relationship, and we see this relationship between um, the people of Israel and, and Yahweh throughout all the Old Testament. And, but here we see a covenant that, David, that God makes with David, and that covenant is that, they, that, that one of David's descendants will stay on the throne of, um, of the people of Israel. And so there is this sort of sense that not only that David, but then um, one of David's descendants will stay there as well. And it becomes something that people can trust because they go, God is a person who you can trust. And that's what happens. For hundreds of years, one of David's descendants stays on the throne. Now, they can't keep all 12 tribes together. There is this civil war that takes place and 10 tribes pull out and two tribes stay in and become the kingdom of Judah. Um, but you see, even in the New Testament, the power of that covenant. If you remember in Matthew, remember Matthew is the very first um, book after the Old Testament. Um, Matt, what does Matthew do at the very beginning of his, of his book? You may remember, before he, get, before he tells the story of, of Joseph and the, and, the, um, and the arrival of Jesus, he has a genealogy. You want to, the purpose of that genealogy is to show that Jesus as he comes in and as he tells this story to a Jewish audience, that Jesus is the descendant of David. And it goes all the way from Adam all the way down to David, and then from David all the way down through um, to where we come to Jesus. So Jesus as the Messiah then is sort of this ultimate um, descendant of King David and is kind of living into that same covenant that David is mentioning here. And then here we come to verses 9 and 10. And you, my son Solomon, know the Lord of your, the God of, of your father and serve him with a single mind 
and willing heart. For the Lord searches every mind, and he understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be, you will, he will be found by you. And if you seek him, he will abandon you forever. Take heed now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house as, as the sanctuary. Be strong and act. David's passing on wisdom to his son Solomon. Wisdom that says, follow after the Lord. David has had his own challenges with that. But he's learned from that, and now he's giving this, this, this wisdom to Solomon. And Solomon will take that wisdom, and he will use it for mo- for, to become a great king. But as you will learn as we study him, he will also be, have his own setbacks, as well as he forgets where the heart of the wisdom comes from. And that wisdom for this for us is this, to follow God wholeheartedly, to trust in the Lord, even as you get a no in your life and you get challenged. What am I supposed to do when God tells me no? How do I keep on going? So part of what David is saying is that we continue to trust in God. David knew that, that, saw, that the, the story of his kingdom would not end. It would keep going even as he had this no to um, what he wanted to do. And so for us to begin to realize is that as we get those no's, God is still preparing our future for us. God does not say no to the temple, right? The temple is still going to be built. What God has done is told David, no, you're not going to be the one to build it. I'm going to do that in another way. It takes us back to that passage in Romans 8, 28. You know, maybe we've had to quote that to ourselves sometimes when we face challenging times. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purposes. What we realize in that is that there are all these moments when we will not get what we want, when life will not go the way we expect it to. But that doesn't mean that God is not working in us or working through us or still bringing about the very best that he wants for us. Sometimes we have to go through those moments in order to be able to live fully into who God wants us to be. My dad had a saying, and maybe some of you all have heard it before, um, that God has three answers when we pray. He either says yes or no or wait. And we have to live into all of those because sometimes the yeses means that we have to say no to something else. Sometimes the noes mean that we have to change directions and envision our lives in some other ways. And sometimes the wait means we've got to slow down and, be pay, and pay attention to see what God's going to do. It just may not be in our own timing. So today, as you reflect on this passage and as we begin to open up this Um, the story of um, Solomon to us as we begin to see how his life can be impactful for us. I hope that you'll find a chance to, to settle in and allow the Lord who loves you greatly to to know that he is working on your behalf and that there may be some no's in your life and it may not be always easy or pleasant but it doesn't mean that God doesn't have some great things in store for you. And it doesn't mean that God is not at work. It just means that we don't always see it. And sometimes we even have to wait for that to come about. So that's a word for us today. I hope it's helpful to you. And I hope that God uses it to continue to strengthen us as we live in the light of Christ. Will you pray with me? And now, our gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the opportunity to open up your word and to listen and to learn and to grow. Lord, as we hear the no's in our lives, may you give us patience and open eyes to see where you are still at work so that we, O oh Lord, can follow after you wherever you lead. We pray these things now in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for being here. And um, I look forward to seeing what great things God does this week in your lives. So God bless you.